All right. Chapter 10 is about statistics, proportional and statistical reasoning. This is the statistical reasoning part. Um, we've done some statistical and proportional kinds of reasoning in general, um, but this is the statistics part of our class. Um, and a lot of what we're going to be doing in sections 10.2 and in 10.3 are graphs. Now, it's actually very interesting because 10.2 and 10.3 could actually be all merged together and called one section. It really could. It's just too long. And so they split it. And they split it in kind of an uneven disbursement kind of way because of the categorical way they're splitting it. Okay, so there's a reason they split it the way that they do, but it makes the two sections uneven. 10.2 is a lot longer than 10.3. Okay? Um, and some of our graphs are going to go clear back to the itty bitties. And some of the graphs are going to go clear up to what you see in high school. Okay, so that's the whole gamut of things that we see. Um, and you'll see that progression as we work our way through. The first couple of ones um, are things that you would do at the younger ages. The first one, pictographs. So a pictograph is a picture graph representing tally, rep, uh, to represent tallies within categories. So they use some kind of a picture. Um, and like little ones do this. They'll do things like counting jelly beans um, or something like that, or they're drawing um, shapes to represent um, a number in a category. And so we're going to do an example that's not kid-friendly per se, um, but it does work pretty well for a pictograph, and it's one from your book, so that's why we're doing it. Um, so here's an example um, of one that we can use the pictograph with. The Automobile Club of America considers holiday weekends to start Friday at 6 p.m. and last until Monday at 6 p.m. If 150 people died on such a weekend by 6 p.m. on Saturday, 80 people from 6 p.m. Saturday to 6 p.m. Sunday, and 100 people from 6 p.m. Sunday to 6 p.m. Monday draw a pictograph. You're not going to do this with your little kids, right? No. This does not sound very nice, right? It's a little bit like, whew, not a great topic. Uh, the pictures work pretty nicely. The values work pretty nicely. And it's an example from your book, so we're going to use this one. But um, the thing that's a little bit interesting about this one and the reason I choose to do this one is because the way that it's worded, it feels a little bit more complicated than it is. Um, normally, we think about days starting sooner about dawn and going to dusk. You know what I mean? Or, or maybe they start at dawn and they go till dawn the next day, something like that. This one's starting at 6 p.m. and going till 6 p.m. So it's still 24 hours, but it's kind of an interesting way to sort for that. But you can kind of see in the picture of what's going on in terms of a weekend, and if you're talking about automobile accidents, why those numbers would make sense, right? 6 p.m. Saturday would be sort of leaving out of town after getting off work, right? So that's why they're categorizing it like that. So we can actually talk about um, our Friday, whoops, Friday 6 p.m. to Saturday 6 p.m. And then we can do Saturday 6 p.m. to Sunday 6 p.m. And then Sunday 6 p.m. to Monday 6 p.m. And these are our categories um, that we're separating our deaths, in this case, into. Um, our pictograph is not a very um, complicated graph. Like, it, it literally, I can't do these lines very well because it wants to do, it wants to connect things. Um, it, it literally just writes the categories down and it draws a picture. Now, there's some things that we need to be careful of. Um, for example, I don't want my picture to represent one person because that means I need to make 150, um, 80, and 100 images. And I, I don't want to make that many pictures. I don't want to make that many tally marks, let's be real. Right, tell them it's not a very exciting picture. That's not what my goal is, but I don't want to make that kind of a picture. So what I need to do is I need to create a key that allows me to make fewer images by making one image worth more than one person. And I can do this in a couple of ways. I'm going to show you what happens when I do it with 20 because I think that's the easier way to do it. But we'll do it for 10, sort of talking through what we would do as well. So we need to draw an image that's easily dividable into two pieces that look different. In other words, if I chose to do a square, it's not a good choice. And the reason it's not a good choice is because when you split this in half, most of the time people would split this in half and it would look like this tiny little rectangle. I mean, okay, but it's really hard for that tiny little rectangle to really for sure look like it's half of it. Are you with me? Maybe it's a third of it. Uh, maybe you really meant a whole rectangle and you were being sloppy. Okay, now it's not impossible. You could split it so that it looked like that. That'd be okay. It's not the worst thing in the world. 
But rectangles and squares are probably not your best bet on an image. Um, the image that I usually use for this one is a heart because it really is easy to cut in half and to see that I have half of a heart. You can use other images too. There's nothing special per se about a heart, but that's what I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna let my heart represent that there's 20 people. Now, if your image is representing a whole number person, it doesn't really matter if it's a square or a rectangle, right? Like it's just gonna be one person. Um, <clears throat> if there's no need to divide your image into halves as well, there's, there's no reason for it to matter what kind of an image you pick. But if I'm going to let mine be 20 people, I need to be able to divide it in half. Because the first one says it's 150 people by 6 p.m. on Saturday, and 150 is not evenly divisible by 20. It would divide by 10, but it doesn't divide by 20. Okay? So if I attempt to divide it by 20, I'm going to get a decimal. What decimal number am I going to get? What's 150 divided by 20? Y'all are scaring me. About 15 divided by 2? 7.5. 7.5. Right? Okay, the zeros don't matter. They're going to cancel each other out. So 7.5. So I need 7 hearts and half a heart because it's 7.5. So I need to make sure when I draw these that they all look like they're approximately the same size. Okay? One beside each other, evenly spaced, that kind of thing. So I have the advantage because I have a copy paste tool of making mine exactly the same. I know that's not fair, but I'm going to do it anyway. So that's six of them. Whoops, actually. There's eight of them, and then I'm going to erase half of one. There's seven and a half hearts. Everybody okay? All right, how many does it say die between Saturday 6 p.m. and Sunday 6 p.m.? 80. 80. Okay, so how many hearts would that be if it's 80 people and 20 people is one heart? Four. So I need four hearts, and they need to not only be the same size, approximately as the one as I did before, but they also need to line up underneath them. Okay? So you should very quickly be able to see that there's four hearts that are lining up, and then there's some extra things on the top row. All right? Four under the four on top. How many are there from seven, 6 p.m. Sunday to 6 p.m. Monday? 100. How many hearts would that be? Five. So I'm going to do five hearts underneath here. Again, they need to line up and be approximately the same size. And our last one, right here. So there's several things I look for when I look for a graph, okay? And, and you should as well. Because people use graphs to mislead people all the time. This is not a, a new trick and they will continue to do it, and you need to know if you're being misled, like really, um, is that you wanna make sure that the images don't look askew. If some of your images had been slightly bigger or they hadn't been lined up, you might be led to believe something from a graph that really the graph didn't say. It just looked like it did, right? The data didn't support that. Um, having a key down here that represents what in the world that heart means. Even if the heart was one person, the key needs to say that. Okay. And the last thing is the thing we haven't done yet. Our graph needs a title. It needs to describe what it is we found. And so this graph's title would be something like Deaths on a Holiday Weekend. Yeah, I think that's it. Good enough. That's on a holiday weekend. If you wanted to say from 6 p.m. Saturday to 6 p.m. Sunday, you could, but our descriptions over here already included that. If you wanted to say where heart equals 20 people, you could do that, but we had a key at another location, so we don't have to put it up there, okay? But it needs to describe what you've just said. Uh, it doesn't have to go at the top. Why did that? Where did my E and D go? Oh, I shifted something and it didn't grab it. <laughs> no wonder. When you, ca when you capture these, sometimes I, didn't ca I guess it didn't capture everything. That's better. Now it makes more sense. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
All right, so as you're drawing this, I was gonna say the title it doesn't have to be the top. The title could be underneath the graph, that's fine. It just needs to be within you know, the area of where your graph is. Okay, all good? Pictographs. They're used very frequently at the younger grades. Uh, this is another one that can be used very nicely with, member, with the younger grades. Um, this is a dot plot, sometimes called a line plot. It's better to be calling it a dot plot, that makes more sense. Uh, this is a quick way to display data with fewer than 50 values. Okay, fewer than 50 values. And um, in spite of the fact that it says dot plot, you can use dots, by the way, uh, a lot of times um, X's are used as well. And because it'll show up better from a visual perspective to you guys, I'm going to use X's. So let me show you what this looks like. Here's our example. The mass in kilograms of each child in Mrs. Good's class is as follows. I really think it should be pounds. This is not a very reasonable number, but nonetheless, it's there. So we're going to go with it. Um, it says make a dot plot for the data. So here's what a dot plot looks like. You're going to do a vertical, I'm sorry, not vertical, horizontal line. And this horizontal line is like a number line, okay? The smallest values on the left, biggest values on the right, and we need to figure out what those are from the data set. So what's the smallest value in this data set? 39. And what's our largest value in our data set? 49. Now, as you're making your marks along the axis, you need to make sure that, again, that they're approximately evenly distributed. They don't have to be perfect, but they need to look reasonably perfect, right? Like, it needs to look like you made an effort. Okay, so as you're making these marks... Here's my 39, 40, 41, 42, 40, and we're going to go all the way to 49. Um, you don't even necessarily have to label every single point down here for me. You know, every other would be just fine. I'm okay with that. But they need to look like they're about evenly distributed. 43, out of space. Okay, I think that's pretty decent. Okay, 39 to 49. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the data points one at a time and we're going to make a dot, or I'm going to make an X on my chart. So the first one, I'm just going to go in order from left to right, is a 40. So down here at the number 40, I'm going to put a little X right here. You can do a dot if you want, it's fine, but you need to make a mark. And then I have 42 and I'm going to make a mark. Now my X's, since I chose to do X's, need to be at the same height and approximately the same size. If you're doing dots, the size thing sort of takes care of itself because dots look like dots, but they still need to be at the same level height, okay? Uh, let's see, we've got 49 and 41. So I have over here at 49, and I have over here at one at 41. 43 and 42, so here's 43. And then 42 already has an X in it, so we stack them, 42. 48 and 39, eight, 39, 46 and 41. 42 and 40, 49, 45, 39, 43, 47, 44, 49, 42. This picture gives you a really good picture, in this case it's weights, masses of children in the classroom, of how the weights distribute of the children. And you see it all in one place. Um, the data itself has an X in every category. It certainly didn't have to. There could have been places where it didn't have anything. It still has to be represented. It would just be represented with no X's in that column, okay? What's this missing? A title. I still need a title. I'm gonna need a title on every single one. What in the world is this graph representing? So this is the mass of each child, or you could even say of the children or something like that. And Mrs. Good's class. Um, there's something else that needs to be included that we haven't yet. Key. Hmm? 
Not a key exactly, but we do need to represent something else that's going on. There is a missing detail. No. Kilograms. Kilograms. So the, if the measurement is given, like how it's being measured, it needs to be represented somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be here at the end. You could have said mass in kilograms up here at the beginning. The kilograms needs to be represented since it was given in the problem. If it weren't given in the problem, we would leave it off, but most of the time it will be. Okay, so if there's units, we would include them. Okay, you ready for another one? Okay, the next one's called a stem and leaf plot. This is kind of like akin to the dot plot, but it's drawn vertically. The numbers on the left are called stems and the numbers on the right are called leaves. This works really well for two-digit data. Okay, so it would have worked really well for our last example where we had the weight in kilograms and they were all two digits. Um, it actually works really well for grades as well because most of the time grades are done in two-digit numbers. So our example we're going to do is in grades. All right, so these are the grades from a first exam. They're all recorded, and we're going to make a stem and leaf plot for the data. Now, <clears throat> we're going to do the stem and leaf plot in two steps, okay? So bear with me. The first thing we're going to do is not going to be our final answer, but I find it easier to do it anyway and to do it twice than to try to get all my ducks in a row and organized as I go, because undoubtedly I'm going to miss something, okay? And I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm, I'm still going to miss something. So I do this in two steps, your choice if you want to or not. What we're going to do is we're going to make a vertical bar. And I want us to find in our data set the smallest value and the largest value, just like we did before. What's the smallest grade or the lowest grade for this test? 43. 43. And the highest? 94. Yeah, we've got a 94. So <clears throat> the stems are all of the tens digit values. And we go from smallest to largest. What's the smallest value in the tens place? The 4 and the 43, right? So over here on the left-hand side, we're going to do 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And if we did have 100 on the test, we'd put a 10 over there. Okay, so we're going to see that happen. Uh, I can't remember if it's on this assignment or if it's in your homework or something. There is a place where that happens. Um, most grades are, are actually not 100, so like that's not a common grade, so it doesn't end up actually coming into play. And again, we're going to go down the list of numbers, just like we did with Mrs. Good's kilograms in her classroom of her children, and we're going to fill them in. So when we see 87, we're going to go to row 8, and we're going to write the 7 next to it. So all the 1's digits are going to come out here on the right-hand side, and these are called the leaves. Okay? So we have 76. So we have a 7, 6. And it doesn't matter the size. You can be as messy as you want, as long as you can read it for this first one, because we're going to clean it up in another version next. Okay? So we have 94 and 58, and 82, and 43, 89, and 53, uh, 67, and 80, 90, 94, 74, 77, 87, 74, 89 and 90. It's not a bad idea to count them and make sure that you actually didn't skip one accidentally. You marked something off and you didn't actually make a mark or something. So if we count this, I've got 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Are there 18 up there? There are. We didn't miss any on this one, but it has happened that people miss them before because you're just moving through things, right? All right, so the stem and leaf plot, however, is supposed to have some order to it. Um, it's supposed to have some organization to it. And right now, we've gotten sort of part of that organization. We, we put them in, you know, it's like we put them in stacks. These are the stacks of the papers that got 40s, and these are the stacks of the papers that got 50s, and 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and 90s. And now what we want to do is we actually want to put them in order from smallest to largest, right? Complete order, not just within, uh, you know, divided among the, the letter grade kind of, you know, idea, but actually in order. So here's the way that this works. We're going to do our same 4 through 9. And within each category, we're going to put that in order. Well, the 43 is the only 40, so I don't have to do anything there. But the 50s have an 8 and a 3, and if I go in order from smallest to largest, 3 comes before 8, so I'm going to switch them. So 3 goes before 8. Now, as I'm doing this, it does matter that they line up. 
So those threes, not because they're threes, but because they're the first number, should be right on top of each other. And they should be about the same size. Okay, so if you make something look extra big or extra small, it gives an illusion that's not real to the data. So we're, our goal is not to mislead people as we're doing that, although that is the goal of some people who make graphs, right? So there's a 67. Uh, my row seven has a six, a four, a seven, and a four. What comes first? Yeah, the four. In fact, two fours, right? Four and four, and then six and seven. On the eight row, what's the organization of my numbers This one, on this one? Okay. And then on the nines row. Okay. And, and it's almost like you can see them in these unmarked columns, right, as you're moving from left to right. I need a couple of things on this one. One of them you know. What do I need? A title. So let's start with the title. So what's the title? What in the world is this? This is grades on a first exam. Um, these are actual data. This was from a first exam that I gave a long time ago uh, for this class, actually. It was their first, first data set. Um, <coughs> The other thing that we need is that we need something that gives indication of what this means. So uh, the reality is that until right now, you might not have seen a graph like this before. And if you're describing this to someone who hasn't seen a graph like this before, they need to know what these numbers mean and in their location. Because a number on the left, a stem, is not what it means the same thing as on the leaf side, right? These are different values. So you want to take a value set from in here. It doesn't have to be one that's in here, but you might as well where the numbers are different. For example, if I chose 77, that's not very helpful because it would not be able to tell if the seven on the left or the seven on the right meant what that meant. So choosing something where it's distinguishably different, like the very first entry is a good one, that four, three. And you would say something like this. You can actually either write a key down on the side or you can add it as part of your title. I'm gonna add it as part of my title this time, but feel free to, sorry, it took me out of the screen there for a second. Okay, so we're gonna write this one. I'm choosing to write it as part of my title. And so I'm going to write something like this, where 4 slash 3, right, that's one of my values that I had, is a 43. That's it. It's not real exciting, but you're just telling them what this notation means. If you have a 4 on the left and you have a, this line in the middle and the 3 on the right, that means it's a 43. Yes? So you have to add the key, it would be just the same? You'd say the same thing. It just would be in another spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily have to write where the word where, I mean, but you could write it in another spot. Yeah. Can we just put like 4 slash 3 equals 43? Yeah, you can. So if you wrote it up here especially, like that, you can do it that way too. Yep. Okay, everybody good? All right, so an add-on to what we just did is something called a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. A back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot is really two stem and leaf plots that are combined to show two sets of data in comparison. So it's a data comparison graph. One will have leaves on the left, on the right, and the other one will have leaves on the left. So what's gonna happen is our stem column is actually gonna be sandwiched in between two sets of leaves. So it'll look like we have our stems in the middle and we have leaves on the right, just like we did, and there'll also be leaves on the left. Okay, so we have a secondary set of data. This is the second exam, and it is from the exact same class, um, real data. And it wants us to make a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot for both sets of data. Now, what I need to do first is I need to get that first set of, I need to get that second set of data into a stem and leaf plot, because we haven't done that yet, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is just create a stem and leaf plot for this data. Everybody with me? And then I will be able to draw it. So as you're looking at your space that you have at the bottom of your paper to write, you need to make it small or you need to make it up here. Like I've actually done this stem and leaf plot. I'm going to do over here in this corner over here so that I can put the actual answer for the back-to-back -back one on the bottom if you want to use your space that way. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our data. We're going to organize it the same way we did before. We need to know what the smallest value is and the largest. So what's the smallest value in this data set? 66. And the largest one? Oh, 64. Somebody said 64. 
Where is that? Oh, I see it. 64. Largest one? 99. Okay, so I've got 6, 7, 8, and 9. I'm going to go through my data set and I'm going to put them in the column or in the rows. Okay, so I have 93, 96, 98, 66, 67, 82, 92, 85, 64, 81, 86, 72, 96, 95. 99, 95, 94, and 74. And then I'm going to clean this one up. But actually, as I clean this one up, I'm going to actually create half the stem and leaf plot that I'm looking for anyway. Okay? So this is my data set that I'm looking at as the one that I'm comparing. I'm going to bring over here, because I don't have it on my screen, this other one that I had over here too from before. Oh my goodness. Okay. Here's the first set. Here's the second set. I just need them all on the same screen. You guys have them on the same paper, but I don't have it all on the same paper here. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a double line here in the middle. And I need it to represent all the stem values. So the stem values from the first set of data started with four, stopped at nine. The stem from the second set of data was six to nine. I still have to have a four and a five, okay? So I'm gonna have four through nine in the middle. Okay, my new data, okay, the new set over here, this is the new one, the second test. Let's do second actually is better. Uh, my second test over here, I'm gonna organize the data from smallest to largest, so I have Six, seven, and four, so 64, 66, and then 67. And on the seven row, I have a two and a four. Those were already in order. And then I have two, five, one, six, so I have one, two, five, six. And then the row that's got 90s on it, it's got a lot. Um, there's a two and a three and a four. What's next? Uh, two fives, so five and five, and then what? Uh, two sixes, yeah, oops, I marked the eight. Two sixes, and then an eight and a nine. Okay, so this is the stem and leaf plot. If I didn't have this other line over here and this extra four and five in the front, this would be the stem and leaf plot from the second set of data. I'm making the back-to-back -back one, so I'm going to take this data right here, and I'm gonna write the same values, but I'm gonna write them backwards. We're going to go to the left. So 43, again, doesn't look very exciting, but it's gonna extend over here to the left like this. But then I do 38, I do a three and then an eight. So it's going from smallest to largest in the opposite direction, so toward the left. Um, kind of like what we do with number lines when we're working with um, like negatives. It's kind of like that. Um, so then I have a 67. I have 70 and I have four, four, six, seven, zero, two, seven, seven, nine, and nine, and then zero, zero, four, and four. I need a title. What is this that I have found? Yeah, it's grades on a first and second exam. You can use the word compare if you would like. Um, we do want to make sure we say first and then second. And this is it's in chronological order. I mean, I've done the first on the left on purpose, right? So it, it comes before it from left to right the way that we read. The first test came before the second test like that. Um, we need to indicate what this means though, right? Um, so where, so I'm gonna take something here in the middle. I'm gonna do this piece right here. I'm, I'm highlighting for our benefit, not because you would highlight on your paper, okay? So I'm just drawing your attention to it that that's the one I'm picking. So where seven, 
slash six slash four means a 67 on exam one, 64 <clears throat> on exam two. So what this graph is supposed to do for us, and we're going to see another graph that does a comparison as well, what this graph is supposed to do for us is allow us to take a look at this and see similarities um, or differences. So you might notice that the first graph is very spread out. It starts from 40 and goes down to 90s, right? Um, you might notice that there is some bunching up, right? There's some really nice bunching up right here in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. That's not bad. Um, over here on the other side, you might notice though, man, there's a lot of A's, right? And there were some A's in the first test, but there's a lot there's not very many Bs by comparison, right? So you can make sort of judgment issues sort of as a visual to the data set by looking at them this way. All right, next one. A grouped frequency table. A grouped frequency table shows how many times, whoops, sorry, didn't get it over there all the way, shows how many times data occurs in a range of classes or intervals. So it groups things together in some fashion. So we're gonna do an example of a grouping that sort of makes sense to us because we're gonna use some data we've already used. But there's nothing special about a group frequency table that says it has to be grouped in a certain way. But it's usually grouped in a convenient way. For example, when we talk about grades, we tend to group things into, into groups of tens, right? The 60 to the 69, the 70 to a 79, we group them in letter grade intervals. Well, that happens in, in lots of places. People group things in certain ways. Um, and so there's usually a natural grouping, or if there's not, they tell you a grouping. They'll say something like they want a class width of a certain width. So we're doing class width of 10. In other words, it's 10 across. Smallest value to largest value includes 10 different values. So ours is actually the same data that we had from our second exam just a minute ago that we created our um, stem and leaf plot from. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like to create a grouped frequency table with that same data. So with that same data, you're going to have one column that's going to be the grade. You're going to have a column that's actually a tally column. And then you're going to have a column that's a frequency column. Now, we are doing grades. We're going to do the standard you know, arrangement of grades into letter grade values. Um, but you should realize that letter grades have not always been distributed this way. Do you know that? When I was in school in elementary um, and middle school, and by the time I got to high school, there was a push to change to what you guys see as your standard grading scale now, the 90 to 100, the 80 to 89, so forth. But it used to be that an 86 to a 92 was a B, and a 93 to a 100 was an A. And I think it went down to a 77, 77 to um, an 86, they weren't even evenly distributed. Okay, so this natural, um, you know, ABC that we think is so normal hasn't always even been that way. So some of those things do change over time. Um, so we're going to do what, these are gonna be called class widths. That's how, how wide our class is. And we're doing a class width of 10. And so you might be looking at this and saying, but Dr. Hans, you went from 60 to 69. Isn't that a width of nine? And, and the answer is no, it's not. It's 10. If you count the numbers from 60 to 69, there's 10 of them. Take a minute and do it. Did you get 10? Yes. There's, this is a class width of 10, right? It includes 10 values. The values from 60 to 69 are 10 different values. So our class width is actually measuring how far or how many values are in that class. So we're doing our standard one that we use um, because it is grades. But in general, your, your scale could be something different. And we're going to make a tally mark. Okay, um, so 93, 96, 98, 66. We're just making a tally car, uh, mark in the appropriate row that we're on. We have 67, 82, 92, 85, 64, 81, 86, 72, uh, 96. You are welcome to 
cross hatch it at five. I think that makes things easier. So certainly welcome to do that. So 96, 95, 99, 95. Whole bunch of them there in a row. And then I have 94 and 74. Again, not a bad idea to count your hash marks or your tally marks and make sure you've got 18 of them. We had 18 before. Do we have 18 now? Yeah, we do, okay? It's easy to lose them, make sure you don't lose them. And then the frequency column is just giving a numerical, like a, a numeral to that value. So this is the number three, this is the number two, this is the number four, and this is the number nine. Okay, it's just filling the, num the, number, the number that's associated with the tally marks. And what do we need? A title, we still need a title. What is this information giving? What is this graph giving us information about? Their grades. Yeah, on a second exam. Um, and there's no key that's needed here, right? There's, there's nothing to give a key for. Our tally marks mean one. All of our data is represented clearly. Um, we have column headers, that's important. Um, the thing that's interesting to note though is that this groups things together very nicely. That's why it's called a grouped frequency table, but you lose specificity. Right? If I'm looking at this, I don't know if those people who got 60 to 69s got 60s or 69s or if it's something in between. I lose some of the specificity, specificity of those values when I do this. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something to be aware of in the fact that this is a limitation of this graph. Okay, histogram. A histogram is made up of adjoining rectangles or bars. The categories are shown along the horizontal axis and the frequency along the vertical axis. Hang on, I'm gonna get this and copy this. I'll, I'll go back to my slide. Here we go. So we're going to create a histogram with the same data set, <laughs> okay? There's nothing special about this data set, by the way. It's just we might as well use the same data set to show what it looks like in a variety of ways. Um, so we're going to create a grouped, uh, or excuse me, a histogram using the grouped frequency table, which is the same as the data set that we already have. So here's our grouped frequency table. I've copied it over here. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to create what you might call like a bar chart. That's not exactly the same as a bar chart. And we'll talk next time about a bar chart and see the difference. This one is called a histogram. Okay, so what we're doing with our histogram is we're marking the edges. So this is 60. And while 69 and 70 are different, we're going to only mark the first value of each of our bars. So 60, 70, 80, 90, and we need 100 on there. It's the ending of the values. So these are our grades. I'm gonna label the bottom axis. These are the grades on, or just actually grades is fine. We'll do grades. We'll put a title on it later that has the other part. Um, and then what goes on the left is actually frequency. So if you take a look at the frequencies, they're three, two, four, and nine, right? So we're going to make hash marks that go up to at least nine, maybe 10 if you wish. And we need to do a hash mark for every one or two units, depending. I'm gonna put, the, this is not very many of them, so I'm gonna make a hash mark for every one unit, but only label every other, so that I'm not over labeling so that it looks confusing. So here's a two and a four, a six and an eight. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put a 10 on there just so that it looks complete. And we look and we say, hey, look, between 60 and 69, there's three and so I'm going to create a bar of height three. And then between 70 and 79, I have two. So I'm gonna create a bar of height two. My bars should look about the same width, right? They, they shouldn't be drastically different. Um, seven, or 80 to 89 is a group, is a value of four. So we're gonna do a bar of height four. And then the last one's a height nine, so it's gonna be much taller than the other ones. Try to use a ruler if you can. I don't have a ruler on here to do this with, but that, that's pretty decent, pretty close. Nope, it's a 10, isn't it? My thing's skewed. Does that look better? 
Y'all tell me from the projection standpoint, is it okay? Okay. Um, we need a title for this. You will also see these often sort of colored in. They don't have to be colored in, but we are gonna color some in later um, when we see a double bar chart or a double group, a double frequency um, histograms. So we're gonna see some things later where they do shade them in for sure. You can certainly shade these in if you wish. I need to have a title along this, not title, but a, um, a information along the side. This is frequency. A label that's the word I wanted I need labels on the top and the left of bottom axis side and bottom axis so I do and they need to describe what this is this is grades on a second exam and we'll pick back up there next time